Have you ever wanted to take a tour of Beaujolais? This time we're doing a tour via these bottles. It's a nice way to taste across three uh, different styles of wine, but from the same region. And um, a lot of people are familiar with Beaujolais. It's a region just south of the main part of uh, Burgundy in France, and Beaujolais overlaps the Rhone department. It's not far from Lyon, which is the third largest city in France, and a culinary mecca. It's an incredible place. A lot of people think of Paris, and I think of Lyon as like the belly or the gastronom gastronomy capital of France. And these wines are really made to go with food, so I put this tasting together because I wanted for, for you guys to be able to explore, okay, this is the same producer's wine, but we have a sparkling example. We have it made from the same grapes into a white wine, and then another grape, but from the same vineyards, you get to see a red example. So it's not just Beaujolais that comes Beaujolais Nouveau before Thanksgiving, or um, just the red wines that you might have with like Cocavan. This is a really cool way to realize that there's more to Beaujolais than just the reds. I always recommend finding a producer that you love and exploring the style of wine that they make. And so we'll start with the Cremant de Bourgogne. So Burgundy is the region I mentioned. Beaujolais is a small section within uh, uh, Burgundy. And we call any sparkling wine that comes from France, that's from outside of Champagne, Cremant. And then we use the term of the region. So you can imagine Cremant de Bourgogne. Cremant is the style of wine from Burgundy. And in our case, you know, it's possible that the grapes only come from, from the region of Beaujolais. It doesn't necessarily say that on the label. I guess it gives the flexibility to the winemaker to be able to buy grapes or to blend grapes from other parts of Burgundy. So it's like the Burgundy region is the biggest. And Cremant is actually really interesting and I think one of the most exciting things that is coming in the world of bubbly um, for, for me because it's so affordable, but it has the qualities of champagne. So in order to be called Cremant, you must do the same method of making the sparkling wine sparkle inside of the bottle, which is called method champenois, the traditional method. That means we take grape juice, ferment it with yeast into alcohol, put that wine in either a tank or a stainless steel, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, or a barrel, and then once we have a base wine, we add the wine to a bottle, in this case, like just like this, we add a little bit of yeast and a small amount of sugar and close the bottle off with a, a crown cap or what looks like a soda pop top. And the wine re-ferments in the bottle the second time. So it gives you this yeasty quality or this toasted brioche and it's really nice. And so exact same thing that's happening in Champagne. The other thing that's similar to Champagne, but for a fraction of the price of this wine is it's 100% Chardonnay, which is the noble grape that is used to make Champagne. So what we have is a really fine mousse, meaning like the bubbles are small and tight and precise. And then we have the Chardonnay characteristics. If you know Chardonnay from drinking white wine, you'll find um, apples and pear and orchard fruit. And often Chardonnay is such a good wine um, because, a grape rather, because it takes on whatever the winemaker does. It's almost like a blank canvas. So if it grows on chalk, it tastes chalky. If it grows, um, you know, uh, or if a winemaker puts it in oak, it'll taste like vanilla and cinnamon and nutmeg or like what the characteristics you get from a barrel. So you can imagine a really great, precise, clean style of Chardonnay when it's made into sparkling. And so we'll take a sip. Oh my God, so good. We often use like things that feel sweet, or feel like um, almost brunchy, right? Like brioche or croissants or baked bread as characteristics or descriptors for champagne. And the reason is, or cremant even, the reason is, imagine that yeast that I told you I put in the bottle. After they do their job of eating the sugar, they start breaking down and they have no more food, if you will. So when they break down, it's called autolysis. It's the gradual breakdown of the yeast cells and that yeast equality gets reincorporated into the wine. So in this case, Cremant, it's a minimum aging of nine months, Sir Lee, which means that that wine rested with those spent yeast cells. You can call them dead yeast cells, but I think spent sounds better. Um, so spent yeast starting to break down in the bottle. After nine months, the producer is allowed to do what we call disgorgement, which would be you freeze the neck of the bottle, 
expel the spent yeast and then maybe quickly add a little bit more wine just to finish the wine and then add um, a cork with a cage so that it, it stays bubbly. I was mentioning earlier that it's really fun to try a producer's wine and then um, all of the styles of wine they make. You might imagine you can do this in the way we're doing it with um, style of wine, sparkling white, red. You can also do it across multiple vineyards, which is really fun. So seeing um, maybe the producer's influence, but from different parcels of his land. And you can always do it with different vintages from the same producer. So you can imagine you can do a tasting with three different vintages. It really gets you to like understand what's going on in the winery and perhaps what it feels like to be in those vineyards. So with that said, we have Beaujolais Blanc and it's a very unique and interesting wine. The grape in this wine is 100% Chardonnay. So if you remember, I was talking about that Beaujolais is part of Burgundy and Burgundy's noble grape is Chardonnay. Chardonnay grows in regions like Chablis or Chasson Montrachet, Merceau, Pouligny Montrachet, these famous names, these famous villages, if you will, that are just north of Beaujolais. And they've become so famous that some of the, the white burgundies that we have as the traditionals, those ones that I mentioned, can cost upwards of you know, $150 in a restaurant. And they're becoming more and more rare. You know, when I was in um, Beaujolais and Burgundy this past April, it was really a bad frost and we, they had these little smudge pots in the vineyards that they would light in order to like prevent the frost from getting to the vines. And the reason that was happening and it's so relevant is because if the frost happens in spring and the buds don't break the way they're supposed to in flower, the yield or the amount of grapes the producer can get is lowered. So because it is happening so often now, we're seeing less and less wines produced from Burgundy and specifically from those heralded vineyards that everyone's craving and needs for their wine list. So enter a little bit more further south, maybe a couple degrees warmer where the frosts are, they're still an issue, but not quite as much as in the north. And you're finding the ability to provide Chardonnay at um, similar, not identical um, types of soils, but similar soils. So here we have Chardonnay 100% from some very old vines. Um, there's a couple different ways that you would trellis your vines or train your vines in various vineyards all over the world. The, the traditional is called like VSP, which it, it, it's vertical shoot positioning and it looks like there's a post with two arms and grape vines grow upwards and they're, they're trained to grow on these wires. The other method, which is very common in Beaujolais, is called like bush vines or gobelet. And so it, it literally looks like a little tree or a little bush um, closer to the ground than the first method. And then the, vine, the grapes just grow almost wild. So it looks like a little bush. Um, and so that's what we're dealing with here, the gobelet. It's not a cane trained. And let's smell. So Chardonnay uh, is kind of a neutral grape by before you put it in something or you grow it in, in a soil. Here you have those like subtle qualities of uh, citrus, like lemon, apple blossom, uh, maybe like just a little bit of saline. Uh, sometimes we talk about saline in a wine, it means like a saltiness. So you can almost feel like this area was once like a seabed and there's probably some sort of seashells in the soil, more so in the northern, in, in Chablis, but you do get that salinity in this wine as well. And when you're smelling it, it smells like there's no oak. So I don't smell the vanilla, the cinnamon, the nutmeg. This is a wine that's aged in stainless steel. It's just like completely fresh. Really makes your mouth salivate. So you feel like, oh, I want another sip. And really, wines that have higher levels of acidity or make your mouth salivate make you crave food. So here you are like getting hungry while watching the video. Um, then the typical Chardonnay texture comes in where it's a little bit round, so it's almost like that perfect lemon yogurt um, with like just grating some citrus on it. So you can imagine you have the juxtaposition of something a little bit creamy and a little bit fresh and, and what sometimes sommelier is called linear, it means like it just kind of like finishes very uh, crisp, if you will. Gamay, you may or may not have heard of it, it's, I would say, um, Pinot Noir's cousin. I mean, not literally they're, they're related, but just that they often are found together. 
and, and they, sim they have similar qualities um, in terms of maybe their texture or the lack of tannins, um, but they're, they're their own grapes and they have their own flavors. And, and Gamay was a grape that grew in the rest of the northern parts of Burgundy and then somehow it kind of like migrated south, which is to say it is better on, uh, grown in these granite soils that you find in Beaujolais rather than the limestone soils um, that you find in the north. And so maybe they, they grew it there and then they said, you know what, it, it's not as, as good here as it, sh as it, it, it tastes. Um, the flavor is more intense in the south, so like by nature they kind of migrated south. But at any rate, Gamay, what is it? It's a red skin grape. Um, it often looks like a little darker, less opaque, or sorry, less transparent than Pinot Noir, so maybe a touch more opaque. And what, what I'm referencing is the ability to read through the wine. So Gamay also often is done in a carbonic style, which means that they'll take these entire clusters of grapes, leave them on the, the stem, and they'll throw these clusters whole, whole cluster, into a fermentation tank. When I say carbonic, what they do is they close the top of a tank and the, the clusters, um, basically, because of carbon dioxide, they explode. So if you remember the formula for making wine says take grapes, sugar, add yeast, you'll get alcohol and you'll get carbon dioxide. So if you trap the carbon dioxide, like what I'm describing, carbonic maceration, then you'll get this, this burst of the berries and you'll get a darker color. Um, but the aroma is really important for carbonic maceration. And so sometimes when you make that style of wine, you'll find it to be very fruity. It'll smell fresh. It'll smell like just picked grapes. So the carbonic maceration is something you could look for as um, we kind of describe it sometimes as like a tutti frutti, like almost like banana. And so that's one style of making Beaujolais. Um, and it's common with the grape gamay, it does well in that wet method. But not all Beaujolais is made that way. Um, you can have as well in, in Beaujolais a hierarchy of raiding vineyards and, and villages, I should say, rather. Um, so you can have, okay, this wine comes from Beaujolais and it's just from all over the region. Then you can have what we call Cru Beaujolais. Cru Beaujolais are these 10 different little villages that are, are higher rated than the rest of the villages. So there's things like Fleury, saint amour Rigny. Um, one of the most famous is Morgon. And so imagine like little towns within Beaujolais that maybe have better sun exposure, have better soils, so they rated them higher. You will pay more money for those kind of crews. They're more age-worthy. Those are starting to get into more serious styles of the Gamay grape. And then we have something in the middle, which is called Beaujolais Village, where here you can blend all different villages into this wine. You have old vines, so you get kind of that balance between you have to wait for it and it's so fresh and fruity that you must drink it right away. And I feel that Gamay is like, literally, there's no one that won't like it because when you take a sip, it's fresh. It has floral qualities, maybe like violets, and um, it's it, lots of red fruit, similar to Pinot Noir, cherry, cranberry, very tart. And the tannins are there, um, and uh, but they're not they're not aggressive. So what I mean by that is Pinot Noir is is. In terms of tannin, it's very low in tannin. It, smell, it feels like silk on your palate. If you think about Cabernet Sauvignon, it has a lot of tannin, so it makes your mouth dry. It feels dusty. And Gamay, it kind of plays between those two. Like it has a starting off of silk, but then it gets like almost like, imagine you're on a bicycle and you accidentally like fall off your bike and you have like, you know, like the pavement. You get like all those dusty little pebbles. It's kind of like that. It's like a little bit of chew or a little bit of bite that makes it interesting. So it's not so smooth, but it's definitely a wine that you don't need food for. You can pair with food as well. So Beaujolais, to recap, is such an exciting region. There's so much to, to taste and explore, whether it's Beaujolais made into sparkling wine, um, Beaujolais Blanc, Beaujolais Rouge, and you can even take this a step further and go out and buy some of those crews I talked about 
and you have Fleury or Saint Amour and do a tasting where you can um, side by side. It's almost like you took your bike and you're driving through the little villages and you get a, ch a chance to really, really explore the region because it's so exciting. If you're in Lyon, you must eat and drink your way through the, the city. It's a city not to be missed. And uh, thanks for taking the journey with me and tasting these wines.